Happy Father's Day. Uh, just to repeat a word back from that song that we just sang. It says that we're trying to get back to God. Basically, I'm a drifter out on a dead end road trying to find my way back home. That might be how you feel this morning. Maybe you felt like uh, things have been drifting a little bit lately. And we're in this series where we're studying Moses, and he certainly found himself out in a desert place, maybe feeling like he was drifting a little bit. But we serve a God who can bring us back home anytime we come and we give our hearts to him in that way. So it is our hope this morning that you would come with a heart open to receiving what God might have for you today, that you might find home here at Westminster today, and that you might elevate Jesus with your life, be empowered by his word, and then go out and embody his love into the world. So that's our hope here at Westminster. Uh, we hope that you're enjoying your Father's Day so far. We're going to enjoy our worship together this morning. I've got just a couple of reminders for us. Uh, over to my right, there is a uh, table here, a supply table. If you have kids who haven't been with us in the month of June, there's kids packets over here for children who might want to grab one. There's also song sheets that we're now printing and a box over here. If you haven't gotten one already, you can come up and grab one of those and that'll help you follow along with the service. So hope that helps everyone out. I'm excited to worship with you today. Uh, Shane is going to come up and lead us in our call to worship to get us started this morning. Good morning. So happy to be here with you guys. Uh, I'm going to start the call to worship. Uh, if you would stand, please. And do they have the, uh, All right. So we'll start with the call to worship. Come, take off your shoes. For well, where we stand is holy ground. God meets us here, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Where we stand is holy ground. The people of this earth, the people of this place, are precious in the Lord's sight. He sees their misery and hears their cries, and he cares. Where we stand is holy ground. Rejoice, for you are standing on holy ground. Here I am. Praise, Praise the Lord. remain standing. We're going to sing a good old hymn that we all know and love. The Mighty Fortress is our God. The Mighty Fortress is our God of work never made Our helper he amid the flood of mortal Spirit. 
after our profession. God, you have an uncomfortable habit of showing up where we least expect you, in a burning bush, in the face of an enemy, in a livestock feeding trough, on a rough wooden cross. Our lives have become upside down. We spurn those you love, and we ignore those whose cries you hear. Suppose that we live in a world where you no longer surprise us. Change our expectations, forgive us, and turn our lives right side up with your radical love. ready to worship and learn from you. Amen. Y'all can have a seat. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Happy Father's Day, if that applies to you. We all have mothers, we all have fathers, and God is our perfect parent, and that puts all our celebrations into perspective, doesn't it? We're in our third week in our series on the life of Moses, and remember the title of this series is Unsettled. And being unsettled marked the whole Moses' whole experience in life from beginning to end. That's part of what we're exploring because we think that it applies to us all the time, maybe more obviously in these days when everything in life seems pretty unsettled. Last, uh, two weeks ago, we talked about how God preserved Moses, brought him into the world and preserved him providentially through the heroic acts of five amazing women. 
And last week, Andrew talked about how Moses' life fell apart when Moses took his passion for justice into his own hands, and then he had to flee. And he fleed, fleed? He fled. <laughs> he fled to Midian. And I don't know if you uh, know your Middle Eastern geography very well. I know I don't. I had to look this up. The place where he went in Midian is about 500 miles away. 500 miles away. That's like going to Wisconsin. I mean, that's a long journey, a long, long journey. Uh, one time I uh, was on a, a college uh, choir tour and we stopped inexplicably for a concert in Winnemucca, Nevada. Has anybody ever been to Winnemucca, Nevada? I really put my foot in my mouth during that trip because I, I told somebody what I really thought about Winnemucca and they loved Winnemucca. But I thought of it as the, the armpit of the world. It's hard to imagine a bleaker place than Winnemucca until you've been to Midian. You know how people told, uh, told directions in the first century? They faced east where the sun came up and they knew that that was east, what was in front of them. They knew what was to, to their left was north and they knew that what was to their, south, to their right was south and to their back was west. And that was called the backside. So if Winnemucca is the armpit of the world, Midian was the backside of the world, literally, the backside. And that's where Moses was, in the, the backside of the world. Uh, the Midian Desert is a formidable place, not a place that has uh, roads, even today. People don't go there unless they're looking for a ex very, very stark experience. And one day, on Mount Horeb, something happened that would change the world forever. And so we're gonna be reading through uh, Exodus chapter 3, 1 through 10, one bit at a time. If you have your Bible, uh, track along with me, but we're going to be just taking it a bit at a time today. So uh, Exodus 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Now chances are, if you know any Sunday school stories, you know this one, right? The famous story, the burning bush. This is Moses' story. This is the story of how God got Moses' attention, revealed God's self to him, called Moses to... Uh, a saving act that would change the course of the world forever that you you and I are here today because the burning bush happened that's Moses unique powerful amazing story but it's also our story because we learn from this how God relates not only to Moses but to us we were learn we learn what it means to respond to the God who takes the initiative to make himself known and so I want to talk about three basic movements in uh, what we're going to read today. The fact that Moses turned aside, the fact that Moses w needed to know why the bush wasn't burned up, and the fact that God spoke and what he said. Those are the, there's, there's so much more, so much we could say, but those are the three things we're going to take a good look at today. So let's pray as we enter this text. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth and plant it deep in us. Shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Well, this account starts with fire. You know, one of, the, one of the basic elements of creation, right? Water, earth, fire, earth, wind, and fire. <coughs> fire is, is consistently associated with God in how God appears and when God speaks. More often than not, God is described as being like a fire, like a consuming fire, a holy fire. Now, why fire? You can imagine doing something with water. You can move water. You can change its form. You can take uh, dirt, earth, clay, you can do something with it, you can manipulate it, but that's not the case with fire. Fire changes whatever it touches. And anybody who's ever sat around a campfire knows how beautiful and, and entrancing it can be to just sit around a fire, right? You could just sit there 
uh, some, a lot of times the conversation around the campfire just stops and people just gaze into the fire because it's mesmerizing. It's so beautiful. It's, there's something powerful and almost um, mystical about that fire, but it can also hurt you. It can be very, very dangerous. And I think that's part of what is behind why God is described and associated with fire so often. And that's how this account begins. Fire doesn't leave things unchanged. You have an encounter with fire. Blaise Pascal lived in the 17th century. He was one of the most famous uh, mathematicians and physicists of his day. He was a brilliant, brilliant man. He was also a well-known theologian. And he had, he had written lots of wonderful, uh, profound thoughts about God, but he had never actually encountered God himself until one night. And we know this because after his death, somebody was going through his things and <laughs> they went through the, the coat that he often wore and they felt something in the lining of the coat, right sewn right into his coat, right where it would be right over his heart. And they undid the stitching and they pulled out this little piece of paper with his uh, handwritten notes, not even whole sentences, just little, just little phrases. And here's what Blaise Pascal wrote. The year of grace, 1654. Monday, November 23rd, from half past 10 until half past 12 fire. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Jesus Christ, your God will be my God. Something happened to him that night that he could only describe as fire. And it changed him. He was a brilliant man, a, a believer, but then he had an, an encounter with God. Excuse me. <coughs> And there is all the difference in the world between knowing about God or even believing in God with your mind and encountering God. And as far as we know, Moses had never encountered God. We can presume that he had heard the stories about God. We, we know that he knew that he was a Hebrew. We know that um, he was aware, but now he's 80 years old and he has this encounter with the God who speaks through the fire. That's amazing. So before, uh, before Moses can have this encounter, he has to make a crucial decision. I'm going to pick up in the second part of verse 2. Listen closely. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. Now, the text is ink on paper, right? And it makes it sound like Moses is like, hmm, what a strange sight. I will go over and see why it does not burn up. That's not the way it happened. These are just words that we need to hear. Moses is like, whoa, what? He sees this, this fire. He's seen fire before, certainly, but this bush is on fire, but it's different. It's completely different. It doesn't fit with what he his frame of reality and he is compelled to go explore why now that is amazing and the the king james bible maybe your your translation says that he turned aside now that hebrew phrase to turn aside means you think you're going this way but hold on i need to go this way it's a literally a detour now if you think about it moses whole life has been a detour right he was born into this hebrew family but things got detoured in a major way and then he was in pharaoh's household and then things got detoured in a major way detour is his middle name and he, once again there's another detour he's asked to take and he chooses to take it you know he could have gone home that day and just said hey zipporah um yeah it was a pretty good day yeah weird thing happened i saw this fire but you know i was just i was busy so whatever no, he went to turn aside, to pursue this thing that didn't make sense. And this story is so familiar, and it's wonderful, but it's also, it also comes with real challenges because we think we know what it's all about. And we think that if we are going to have an encounter with God, if you are going to hear from God, if God is going to speak into your life, then it has to look like a burning bush. And you might 
pray and hope and wait for that kind of burning bush experience, but you know what? It's probably not going to happen, at least like that. Probably not. But God still speaks through burning bushes today in your life and in my life. The issue is whether we are able to see them and whether we choose to turn aside. Uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning is one of my favorite poets. She has this great, uh, great little poem. <coughs> it goes like this. Earth is crammed with heaven and every common bush a fire with God. Only the one who sees takes off his shoes. The rest just sit around and pluck blackberries. Every bush is a fire with God. The earth is crammed with heaven. The God who revealed himself to Moses still reveals himself to people today. So what does that look like? Well, maybe you have a story to tell, and maybe you should tell it. It might look like a terrific a coincidence or something that seems like too too coincidental to be um, <laughs> a mere coincidence. Excuse me. <laughs> it might seem like just something else that just doesn't fit with your understanding of reality. Something happened and you just can't make sense of it. Or something seems uh, like a crisis that you've had to face and deal with. Or um, something has... Um, really upset you or really thrilled you, but you haven't taken time to explore what that might be all about, what God might be saying in that. Uh, a couple of years ago, something happened to me that was deeply upsetting. It was, it was really, really hurtful, but I, I came to realize it. I just kept hearing in my head, not a, not a voice like you're hearing me, but I kept hearing, this pain is out of proportion. Like, this is rocking you far more than uh, that it might have otherwise. You need to look into this. You need to ask God, what is this all about? There are all sorts of ways that God appears to us in burning bushes. Moses takes the time to turn aside. He's not too busy like we can be. He's not too distracted. He's not unwilling to have his world changed by what he might learn. He turns aside, and that's, a, that's for us, too. So the second thing that I want to look at in this passage is how Moses is insistent to know why the bush is not burned up. So the text goes, it might seem like kind of a, a minor detail, like, yeah, 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 I know, that's kind of how the miracle happened. It didn't burn up. Cool. But Moses really needs to know this. In fact, the, the text goes out of its way to explained that Moses went out of his way to figure out why it wasn't burning up. Because we know what things on fire look like, and this was different. So I'm going to read verses 4 through 6. When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to see why it didn't burn up, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, which was a, a typical... Hebrew way of speaking intimately to someone, like, I know you well. Think about uh, when Abraham was on uh, the mountain, he was about to sacrifice his son uh, Isaac. Remember what God said? Abraham, Abraham. When the apostle Paul was on his way to Damascus, God got his attention in a big way. Remember what he said? Saul, Saul. That's what's going on here. God is is speaking intimately into Moses' life. Sorry, a little, little detour that I took there. And Moses said, here I am. He didn't say, finally, where have you been? I've been here for 40 years. You're a little overdue. No, he said humbly, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. God in initiates the encounter with Moses. That's who God is. 
we might think of uh, religion in general or even Christianity as us seeking God, uh, seeking enlightenment, seeking uh, you know, progress in the spiritual life. But that's not what this faith is. It's meeting a God that we didn't invent. It is uh, finding that the God who uh, approaches us who is a God who has been searching for us, who initiates things in our life, who initiates conversation with us. This is a God who is glowing with his presence and his glory. And Moses sees this sight, and God speaks, and he says, Take off your shoes. The place you're standing is holy ground. Moses' response isn't, Cool. I know a really great worship song about that. You know, we just we sang this song, God, you are holy, you are holy. But I wonder sometimes if I and if you think about what we're singing when we say that. God, you are holy. That is not, this is not a hallmark moment. You know, this is not a top 40 bestseller. This is meeting the ultimate person, the ultimate being in the universe and being in God's presence. And it's so amazing. God says, Moses, take off your shoes. That's an abject act of worship. And Moses is like, okay, I can't get them off fast enough. And he bows down. But God doesn't say, Moses, get out of here. You're, you don't belong here in the Holy of Holies. He said, this is holy ground, but you are welcomed here. I have drawn you here. And that's who God is, a God of intense holiness, but also welcoming love. Both of those things are happening at the same time, always. And I observed this once. Uh, last summer, <laughs> my family and I went to, uh, we're, we were in Minneapolis, and we went to Valley Fair Amusement Park. Anybody ever been to Valley Fair? Any other big amusement park? Anybody love roller coasters? There's a roller coaster in Valley Fair called The Wild Thing. And uh, I love roller coasters, but they scare the bejesus out of me. I mean, not, <laughs> that was a poor choice of words. They, they, <laughs> they scare the living daylights out of me. And uh, the line for this line was long, longer than any other line in the amusement park. People could not wait to get on it. And then when they got on it, they were scared to death. I mean, this this uh, roller coaster goes up higher than anything else in the park, and then way down, there are several uh, times throughout the ride where you're certain you are going to die. And you get to the end, and you say, like my son Aiden said, let's do it again. <laughs> God's holiness is like that. It is incredibly beautiful and compelling and thrilling and, and absolutely terrifying. How can those things be happening at the same time? But that is who God is, and that's what Moses experiences. Moses experiences it in, in that intense holiness of God, that he is empty-handed, that he is absolutely unworthy, an absolutely broken person. This is always what happens when people encounter God or encounter an angel in Scripture. Dwight Moody uh, noted that in, in the story of Moses, uh, that it comes in blocks of 40s. There's a, a 40 years when he's in Egypt, 40 years in Midian, and then 40 years afterward, which we'll get to. And he said this about Moses. He said, Moses spent his first 40 years thinking he was somebody. He spent his second 40 years learning that he was a nobody. Now, not, that, not that he's a nobody who has no value, because we can tell that lie to ourselves, right? But before God, he was nothing. But he was loved. He was called by God. He was called by name by God. And he came to realize that as he looked into that burning bush, the fire, the fire and the light and the voice was coming from God. But that bush was a picture of himself, a dry bush that had nothing to speak for it. Uh, nothing going for itself, but that God was present in it. And so Andrew is going to share uh, a little message for the children and for all of us. Uh, I guess, kids, if you if you want to, you can come up close. Otherwise, well, not too close. Uh, this is holy ground. Yeah, if here. you have any kids, I know there's a few in the cars, too, and I want to make sure that you all can see uh, my burning bush down here. And so this is kind of a slowly foiling plan with the wind knocking over this beautiful bush that I had built here, but we'll make it work. So kids, if y'all can see this, I want to ask you
you a question. Have y'all ever tried to burn a anything that was green? Who who of the kids have seen a couple back here, a couple in cars? Have any of you ever tried to burn something that was green before? Does it catch on fire very well? No. Like if I took if I took this bush, this green bush, and I tried lighting it, it's not gonna light very well. And especially if my lighter doesn't come on. Don't try this at home. I checked this right before. <laughs> we might have to uh, get crazy here. But this bush, no matter what, it would not light. If, if it was green, it wouldn't catch on fire very well. Awesome. Thanks, yes, John. bring it on over, John. Thank you. We'll see if this works. it briefly point being this would not catch on fire if it was if it was green it wouldn't catch on fire very well and so kids if you're ever trying to set a fire do you go looking for stuff like this or do you go looking for a bush that looks more like <laughs> more like this this is more of the kind of stuff you want to grab if you're trying to start a fire right because dry stuff is better for fire. So here's a question before I try to light this, I don't even know if this is going to work anymore, but before I try to light this, here's a question for you. Sometimes, kids, do you feel like you have a lot of pressure on you to be really good at all the things? Like if you're on a sports team, do you feel like you have to be the best on your sports team? Do you ever feel that pressure? I know when I was a kid, I sometimes felt like, man, I got to get straight A's, I got to be the best on my sports team. I got to be the best at everything I do in my life. And, and sometimes we can get trapped into thinking that our value, our self-worth, is, is, is dependent on how good we are at things. And we think to ourselves that we need to be this flourishing green bush. Like this. We think we need to be uh, this alive green bush. Okay? And... That is not the case, always. God wants us to do our best at all things. But guess what? God can light a fire with anything. Okay? And so, if you feel like you're struggling at times, if you feel like, man, I'm not the best person on my team, or I'm not the person who got straight A's this semester, or whatever it is, maybe you're struggling with something, maybe you feel a little bit more like you're the B team at times, that's okay. And I'm not saying don't try your best. I'm not saying don't try to be the best you can be. But guess what? God can take anything and light it on fire. And in fact, sometimes the most humble of us, the ones who don't think we're the best at everything we do, the, the ones like Moses here in this story, where he shows up to the scene and he's humble and he's, he's bowing himself before God and saying, you know what? I am nobody in comparison to you, God. He was actually more kind of like this dry bush. So, we're going to give this a shot. I don't know what's going to happen. You want a little more help? burning bush. <laughs> never has a youth pastor been more excited for a children's message and never has he been more <laughs> defeated as he tried to pull it off. Under normal circumstances, kids, you would light a dry wood to create fire. And, and, and out of that, out of wherever you are, in your humble circumstances, that's when God can use you the most. So if you're feeling a little dried out, if you're feeling a little 
depleted, if you're feeling like, man, I might be on the B team when it comes to this one thing in my life, whatever it is, keep yourself humble before God and know that he can light a fire with you under those circumstances. He can do that in your life. Let the record show that the fire that we started today was completely under control. The text doesn't say this, but I think this is what it teaches us. That Moses learned that day why the bush was burning and it wasn't consumed. He learned that it was burning with God's fire and God's light and not anything that came from the bush. And that's the lesson that Moses needed to learn for himself. And that applies to us as well. That God's light and God's fire burn, can burn within us. That doesn't require anything from us. It is all about what God can do in us. Mo, uh, Rosellen uh, quoted the, the lyrics to a song earlier, which are really great. Let me know if I get this right. Uh, Mo, Moses could have sung, I am just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. That's what Moses learned at the bush. God can burn in us with his light. So God has already introduced himself. He's uh, drawn uh, Moses into this holy encounter. And then God continues and then reveals why it is that he has spoken. I'm going to read verses 7 through 9. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of their land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, the land of Canaan. And, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. you got to think that Moses is thinking, finally. Like, I, I have this passion for justice, which Andrew talked about last week. And here I have been in agony in Midian for 40 years, knowing that things are still horrible there, that people are still suffering, that people are are being uh, born and living and dying under this horrible oppression of Pharaoh, and God doesn't seem to be doing anything about it. How can God allow such horrible things to happen in the world? Where is he? And God shows up and says, I have noticed, and I have come down to rescue them. Moses is thinking, what a relief. God, I can, I'll show you where to go. I know, I know how this works. I, I can take you there. Not that you need that. I'm, so, I'm sorry, 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 God. But you can do this. You're the most powerful God. Look at you. You're speaking through a bush. You can do this. It, it answers the question that we so often ask. God, how uh, do you notice? Are you aware of what's going on in the world? All the horrible things that are going on in our world today. Do you even care? Are you doing anything? How come I don't see you at work? How come this pain in the world and this pain in my life doesn't seem to be going away? And this passage tells us that God does notice. He does care. His sense of timing is incomprehensible to us. Absolutely, we do not get that. But God is working behind the scenes. Even when it seems to be taking forever, God is laying the groundwork. God is moving pieces. <laughs> God is executing his plan. And that is such good news for Moses. Psalm 121 says that God never closes his eyes. He never sleeps. He's always aware, and that is incredible for us to uh, reflect on. Moses has a passion for justice. And he's so glad to hear that God is going to come do something about it. And then there's the final twist. And this is what's going to launch us into the rest of the story. And we're going to reflect on Moses' response to what God says next week. Here's the twist. God has said, I'm going to do this. I got it. I'm aware and I am acting. So now, go. 
one little word in English, two letters long. So Moses, go. Go. Where are we? Verse 10, thank you. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. God is acting, but he is going to do it in and through Moses. Just like this, this fire, this light is burning in and through this bush. See, God can intervene in any way that he wants. God can do miraculous things. God can suspend what we understand to be the laws of physics and science. There's nothing too hard for God. But so often, God works and God comes to people through people. That is just how God does it. With his presence and with his power, he works through people. So you may be facing something today. You may be facing a real heartache. You may be facing something, a problem that you just don't know how it's ever going to get any better. In, in your own life, in our community, in our nation, or in our world, uh, you just don't know how it's going to happen. And I confess that lots of times, more often than it should be, when I pray, I, what I find myself actually doing is just worrying in God's presence. Like, God, how is this going to get any better? Like, uh, I don't know how, um, I just don't know what can be done here. That's not, that's not really praying, is it? it? I mean, it's kind of telling God how we feel, which is, which is good. But just worrying in God's presence is not all there is to prayer. It may be that the answer to the problem that you keep worrying about before God the answer to the problem that you are lifting up and saying, oh God, here is the big dilemma. Here is the big puzzle that I, I can't figure out. It may be, as E.D. Hill once said, you are God's answer. So go. It doesn't mean to go and just be a bull in a china closet. It doesn't mean to just go and just be a, be a Christian jerk before the world. It doesn't mean to be insensitive. It means go. Be bold if the God is sending you. Speak the truth, but speak it in love. But go. It may be that God is using you, calling you from whatever burning bush is in front of you to go and act. Because faith in this God is not just a faith that happens between our ears. It's a faith that gets worked out in the way we live. Jesus says, don't call me Lord. If you're not going to actually let me be Lord and do what I say. And this is where Moses finds himself. There's actually more to what Dwight Moody said, and I'll close with this. Moses spent his first 40 years thinking he was somebody. He spent his second 40 years learning he was a nobody. He spent his third 40 years discovering what God can do with a nobody when you go. So I want to invite us to a time of offering our lives before God. Yes, we give of our resources. But right now I want to ask you to offer something that's going on in your life where God is um, giving you an opportunity. Listen for that voice for God to say, just go. And it might be, make a phone call. It might be uh, go to a city council meeting. It might be anything. But whatever is going on in our life today, that, that thing that is most front and center, let's just take a moment and offer that to God. Listen for God's voice and hear what God is calling us to do. God, like Moses, may our response before you be, here I am. 
God, hear our prayers as we lift them up before you. We thank you that you're a God who initiates encounter with us. That we don't have to find you. You are constantly finding us. <laughs> God, help us to know more deeply what it means to serve you as a holy God. A God who is compelling and beautiful, overwhelming in your power, but also a God who is welcoming us in your grace and your mercy and your love. Help us, God, to turn aside, to take time to not be so crushed by our schedules and our expectations and our <coughs> excuse me, distractedness, but to turn aside and to pursue those things in our life that are calling us to listen to you, to consider what you may be doing and saying in the circumstances that we're living in. God, make us available as a, a bush that is not so full of its own greenness, but open to you in our, in our unworthiness to be lit a fire by you and called to go where you send us. And we thank you for the amazing nature of your scripture as we see this bush, this tree that Moses uh, encountered you through. We remember the tree in the garden at the beginning, the tree of life. And the tree of life that is at the end in Revelation. And we are living in between, in between those trees. God, you make yourself known in these tree moments. As you did for Moses, you still do for us today. And most especially, God, in the tree on which Jesus hung, where you revealed yourself, you revealed your true nature, your heart for the world. And the way that you make yourself known, you make, the way you make your power and glory known through Jesus' weakness and suffering. And that's how we follow him. But God, hear our prayers. Speak to us in this account of Moses. Reveal yourself and your plans and your direction for our life. And may we be your obedient, grateful people. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this next song is a prayer that God would do just that. So we're going to continue in our heart of prayer here and singing this out. Uh, believing that God can take us and use us, call us out into beautiful places where he would empower us to be his people. That's a really beautiful thing that we get to say and pray. So the first line of the song says, you call me out upon the waters. It just gets right to it. Let's hear God's call to go.
this our prayer today, church. Come on. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger. Scripture is so rich. There's always uh, such a, a wealth of uh, riches in them that uh, can never be totally mined. But one thing that um, didn't take time to dig into today during the sermon, but we're going to see this throughout our walk with Moses over the summer, is that there's there's more going on here than than we can see. Uh, this is classically called a theophany, Moses meeting God at the burning bush. Theophany, theo is God, phaneo is uh, revealing, God is being revealed through the bush here. But it's also a Christophany, that is a revealing of Christ. And in, there's uh, way more than I have time to talk about right now, but it is actually uh, the second person of the Trinity who is... A present there in the fire speaking God's word to Moses uh, there's a, a episode in uh, Revelation chapter 22 where an angel is uh, talking to John and uh, is tempted to fall down and worship the angel and the angel says no 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 don't worship me I'm not worthy of worship but that doesn't happen in this episode here at the burning bush Moses falls down in worship and it's in uh, verse 1 or verse 2 of Exodus 3, it says that an angel of the Lord spoke from the bush. But that angel, that messenger, was the second person of the Trinity who is present there with Moses in all his sinfulness, exuding God's holiness, but welcoming Moses, offering mercy and forgiveness for everything that has happened in Moses' life. And then calling him to a new life to go for the purpose for which God made him. We find that in the person of Jesus Christ. As we turn aside to see what God is doing and what God is saying in our life, Jesus is involved in, in that in our life. 
as we see how it is that God's fire can burn in us and not require us being burned up, but that God can be present in all our brokenness, in all the, the dryness of our own life. And God's speaking his living word to us through the person of Jesus. Let that be a reminder that as we go from here to, to turn aside, as we go to uh, burn for God without being burned up ourselves, and as we go to uh, listen to what God is saying and acting on it in our life, Jesus himself walks with us. We're going to get into that next week. God says, I will go with you, Moses. You will not be doing this alone. You and I are in this together. So remember that wherever we go, whatever burning bush that we are encountering in our life, whatever way that we are being called to respond to God and to receive his mercy, to receive his new calling in our life, we're doing that in company with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So may the grace of Jesus, may the love of God, may the power and the encouragement and the joy of the Holy Spirit go with you and be with us and shine through us, burn through us now and always. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen.